we're going to talk about legal process management tonight. And uh, so you can see right off the bat, there's a mismatch between how many of you are entrepreneurs, want to be entrepreneurs, have been at startups, and how many of you understand legal processes. And of course, they matter a lot. Um, they're, they're the crux to starting a company, funding it, hiring. Um, but it, it's a black box to most of you at the beginning. So Steve and I started Indeca in 1999, and we sold it 12 years later, and 2011. And when we started, we had a legal binder that was about yay big, and it had everything we needed to know about the company. It had our uh, articles of incorporation, our founders agreement, all of that. By the time we finished, so 12 years later, we had a, a wall of binders. How, what, what would you? Yeah, I mean, it's just stacks and stacks. Stacks and stacks and stacks. Yeah. So this was the legal life of a company in 12 years. And it was very expensive. It took a lot of time. And it was very boring if you tried to read it. Um, and, and it created a lot of risk. And, right? Well, um, it, you know, it mattered. Yeah. The, this thing mattered a lot. Um, so here's a, a picture of it. I'll just do this. So how do you get one of these bookshelves? And the answer is legal process management. And there's two key ideas here. Uh, the first is that you don't need to be a lawyer to do this, as you know. But you do need to know just enough that you can delegate a lot of this and work with the lawyers. So you want to master the salient terms and delegate the boilerplate. So that's something we're going to come up on um, in a little bit. And the second thing is process. It's a business process. So the reason you have a business process is to tame complexity. Document by document, this is all very easy. Any one of you could Google something like a founder's agreement, read up on it, and learn it. But these things compound. And by the time they become that bookshelf, uh, you know, it's not rocket science for one document, but that bookshelf is. So the whole purpose of having a process is to tame that complexity. So what we're going to do is switch over very soon to a simulation of some key stages in founding a company. And the purpose of the simulation is to give you a sense for what are these salient terms and how do you go through the, you know, the legal process. Um, of, of, of founding and early hires. And there's a couple themes that are going to recur while we do that. The first one's time and money. So unfortunately, legal doesn't add a lot of value. Um, is, is that, <laughs> that's not fair, it's is necessary. it? It's <laughs> necessary. It's necessary. It's something you can, um, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely necessary, but it's not of strategic importance to, to your company, especially when you're a founder in the early, early days. Um, not only that, it introduces a lot of risk. So when you're a founder, if you imagine the pie chart of how you spend your day, you know, business development, hiring, recruiting, product, funding, something like that. But the truth is that these legal documents are insidious. They pop up. They eat up a little of your time, and then they eat up more and more, and that's a big opportunity cost. It's time you're not spending on what matters. The next bit is risk. So not only does it not really add value, it can take away a lot of value. That can happen if you get your terms wrong, or as complexity creeps in, if you miss deadlines or filings, if you don't make a change that needs to propagate through other documents. So that wall of documents can become a time bomb. I can give examples of someone lo losing a million dollars because a particular paragraph was forgotten to be put into a board resolution, right? I mean, like, it, it is that big a deal. Or it could be much smaller where someone lost the share certificate and now they're being charged $5,000 to recreate some document that they never really requested in the first place. You know, like, there's just uh, piles of these that I could go into from my real world experience. and. What we wanted to do was at least give people some awareness of you know, how, to, how to think about some of the stuff and get some feedback on we're trying to automate some of this to make everyone's lives a lot better. Yep. Right. 
Um, you know, the biggest risk of all was in the billion dollar acquisition. It happened in eight weeks. So in corporate terms, that's like going to Vegas for the weekend and going to the Elvis Chapel and getting married. I mean, that's incredibly fast. So a squadron of lawyers came and there was a real documents. time risk. Yeah, and, yep. and there's missing documents, right? I mean, over the course of 12 years, you moved documents from one file cabinet to the next. Some of them got stuck back there. You know how that happens, right, with like your drawers, but instead of it being your socks, it's like someone's inventions assignment, right? And then all of a sudden that now you have that in your escrow, there's this risk. Someone might claim that they never signed away their, you know, the IP and all this kind of it stuff. It matters a lot. Yeah. The final theme is rails. So here's the good news is that shelf of documents was 99% similar to any other tech companies. All right, this is boilerplate mostly. The other 1% matters a lot. So the idea here is we want to keep you on rails. We want you to be creative where create, creativity adds value. And the rest of the time, you could be different, but every time you're different, you add risk. So try and know where it matters to be different and where it doesn't. Um, so with that, we're going to run the, the simulation now. And we're going to go through three milestones, if, if we have the time. Uh, we'll do formation, so founding a company, and then angel funding, and first hires. And um, I'll turn it over to Steve. Do, do you want to um, do the description of how Shoebox, what, what the vision was for it? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. Sure. So basically, what I came to, I mean, so at Indeca, we had went through a lot of stuff. And as we said, it was this pile of documents. In fact, I shared that stack with Jason and he, st he wasn't intimidated. He's actually was. I was definitely intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> we said we want to automate all this because what happens is it's the same stuff over and over again. And then I'm also involved. I've launched a bunch of other companies. I mentor a lot of entrepreneurs. I'm advising. I'm on boards. I've done investments. And you just see the same things over and over again. It was eating up more and more of my time. And we wanted to find a way to make this really simple. And so there's all these documents that today end up in a shoebox. Right? And the reason why is because there's no formal processes around them. Okay? You, know, you have accounting systems that keep all the accounting from ending up in a shoebox once you get on QuickBooks. Right? When you're pre-QuickBooks, you kind of have everything in a shoebox. I literally was there. I had this big shoebox. And I uh, did not envy the person who I handed it to to go through it and figure out <laughs> what we did. But, um, but these documents are all along as the company progresses from when you found it, your articles of incorporation, to your employee docs to your own founder's agreement, to share certificates, to NDAs, to when you create subsidiaries, to, I mean, you know, board resolutions. And what you find is you end up spending a lot of time on this stuff. It's one thing for the expense, but another thing is where, some, you know, I, I, I joined a board for Andreessen Horowitz recently, and it was pretty much a greenfield company. But it took us six weeks to close from a very clean term sheet. And that was six weeks, that leadership team wasn't getting their job done. That stuff has to be made a lot quicker, okay? So it's and not as distracting, where people aren't arguing over stuff that doesn't matter. They're arguing over the things that do matter. Um, and so um, why don't you show a quick example, if you're ready, Jason, and then we'll go into these scenarios for you know, discussion. That sounds good. So I'm going to run through just incorporation. So this defines, this is a f filing that you have to uh, um, submit to whatever state you're going to incorporate in. And there's a whole bunch of stuff. Which state do you want to incorporate in? Where do you go? That's a whole other topic. Uh, it turns out that a lot of companies end up filing in Delaware. Um, and that's. Does everyone know why people work with Delaware? Anyone, anyone want to volunteer to share that? Or I'm happy. Actually, I saw you raise your hand back there. Why does everyone incorporate in Delaware? I, I thought it has to do with also why credit card companies have their headquarters in Delaware. Well, credit card companies are in Minnesota or, or, or South Dakota, I think it might be. Yes? Uh, I thought it was a corporate tax. They have a huge benefit of filing their it, 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 it turns out the number one reason for Delaware. Okay, you've got one in the back. We have a registered agent. There's that. Okay, so someone said registered agents. We heard corporate tax. Um, we heard about credit card companies. Anyone else? I know the lawyers know the answer. <laughs> That's cheating. Back there. There we go. Yes. And so what that means is when there's a dispute, it's very predictable how these things will happen. So you can actually craft legal documents and structures, structures with some predictability. Okay. Because and it's just that they've specialized in it, and they have a lot of their uh, 
um, they, they get a lot of income as a state with all the fees associated with this. So they have, that's, that's their niche, okay? And the registered agent piece actually just comes out of the state wanting to have an address that they know that they could uh, basically serve you with documents if you do something wrong. And, and keep in mind, when every you start, state you need one for. When you start peeling the floorboards on how a lot of this stuff works, it's very archaic. I mean, it's like it's still in the. I mean, fax machines are considered cutting edge <laughs> in a lot of these processes. Okay, like the fact that you need a mailing address at this point, it should be like an email address, a website should serve just the same purpose, but. There's a lot of fees coming in for all those registered agents, so they're not looking to change the law anytime soon. So really that filing, the initial filing is defining your, <clears throat> basically the name of your company, which is part of their, their deal. They wanna make sure that you have some unique name for your organization that's filed with Delaware. And then you're also defining the structure of your equity. So you, the number of shares that you have outstanding is almost like your, your monetary, your, your dollars, right? And you only have so many dollars that you're allowed to give out. And Delaware is going to keep track of what that cap is. And in fact, a few they, important decisions. They like. charge you an annual tax based off of how many shares <laughs> you have outstanding. So, but a lot of that can be manipulated, and that's kind of how they get stuff set up. So, let's see if I can find a PDF in here. So that's about it for this process. Okay. So, when you're starting a company, you know you can if you pick up a book, they're going to talk about all these different corporate structures, et cetera. You know, there's S corps and LLCs and if you're, gonna, if you're looking to build a business that's going to be an innovation economy company that's going to take outside fan, financing, you know, 99%, you're just starting a C-Corp, okay? And most of the details aren't all that important. You can take kind of the boilerplate because when you go and do a financing, you're going to negotiate the terms that ultimately are going to determine what your actual structure is, how many board members, all this kind of stuff. Right. If you're never going to have the, if you don't think you're going to go and have institutional financing, then you probably you're going to put more time in to get it right up front. Okay, but if you're going to ultimately have an investor come in, they're going to, they're going to change whatever you've got for the most point, right? Versus the the boilerplate. And so the most useful thing that I thought I would talk about is usually it's a group of founders. You know, we have a we're here at a school, right? So usually you think it's a couple students coming together. How do you think about equity allocation? That, I mean, how many people have asked that question? Right, show of hands, trying, are wondering about that. Okay, we got a fair number. And one of the important things, while you're a student, you value ideas a lot. You know, an idea, it's all about the idea. Like, I've got this idea, and that's it's all this value. I mean, it took us 11 years building that business. So do you think it was the idea, or do you think it was the execution against the idea that created the value? The idea got us going, okay? And I've come across many times where a group of students, they get into business plan competition, and then they graduate. Two go off, one works for McKinsey, another one goes to work on Wall Street, and then the third one is, is building the business, but they split the equity three ways, which is insane, okay? Because that person doing all the work, they don't have any help, yet the other two are going off doing something else, right? So don't do that, okay? Like, there's a concept of vesting, okay? And so you could decide, okay, why don't we make it vest? And make it a five-year vest, right? Don't make it like four-year. If your founders think this, it takes a while to build a lot of value, right? If someone just helps for three months, right? If, you, if you're splitting it three ways, give them three over 60, right? As their, as their vested period. That's what it should be, okay? Like, you, it, it's really, um, I, I can't impress that enough on everyone. And you described three, three over 60. Uh, it's so five year vest, five times 12, 60 months, three would be three months of that, right? If that was for three months while you were in school, you're working on it together, okay? And so that's the first cut. The next cut when you're thinking about how to allocate equity is what is each person bringing, okay? Like some people might be bringing a lot of credibility to the business, they might bring particular subject matter expertise, and it's, it's fair for there to be some differentiation based on that. Like some people, you know, like credibility around financing can be very important. Like when you think about assembling a team, there's some people when you add them, you actually become that much more financeable. You might even grow the value of the company substantially. So it's kind of self-funding to give that person more equity, okay? The, um, and you know, I can't emphasize enough what are considered standard terms are things like vesting, like having a cliff is also a standard term. Now, you might choose to not have that for your founders, right, because you have vesting. But 
when I, when I find companies where they haven't put investing with the founders and one of the partners doesn't work out right, it's not pretty because they just leave and there they have their stake and the person left is creating all the value and the other person's benefiting it and they're not even there. And typically it was not amicable or amiable when they left. So it's, it's a very frustrating thing for that person who's still building the business. So you got to get that stuff right. But it turns out these are standard terms. This is what any venture capitalist will ask you to have in place before they put money in the company. And I strongly encourage folks to pick a longer vesting period if you're, if you're, if you're committed to the business, because then you're, you're, you know, you're basically um, sending a message to everyone else that you know, you're not asking for anything you're not doing yourself. Right? That's just one of my philosophies in building a business. So, and define cliff. What is a cliff? Oh, cliff. Anyone know what the cliff is in investing? Anyone want to? Yeah. Yeah, so typically 12 months. So if you leave before 12 months, then you don't vest anything. Uh, even if you start investing when you take an institutional financing, you might be asked to restart your vest. And it could be a very reasonable thing. You know, if you haven't, you know, if you, I mean, people want you locked in to build the business, right? Versus just to have ownership and not be participating. And it's a lonely job building a business. So I often encourage, if you're just one founder, find another person who's going to help shoulder the load. It's a lot of work, okay? Um, and founders typically play a different role than anyone else. Okay. So, Jason, do we have a legal document now to, to look at? Maybe we had a question. Okay. Yeah, the question for vesting. What about if someone works at the company part time while being a student? It, it, you can you can set it up any way you want. It's perfect. I mean, you could you could say like, look, they're not getting paid anything, so I'm not going to have a cliff because they're really kind of that's their compensation, and that's perfectly fine. Right? Um, if they're a student, you might choose to start their vesting when they become full time. Right? And that's an incentive to become full time. Right? Sometimes you use this as a tool, right? How you, you know, uh, put these terms in. And do you also have the lever of the number of shares? So not everyone necessarily has to have an equal stake in the first place. Yeah, that's, that's definitely not the case. Right? <laughs> the, um, the other thing you should know about is. There's a lot of stuff around taxes. You have to, you know, like if someone owns their shares up front versus they have options. So at the very beginning, the value of the shares are virtually worthless, right? They're, you know, it's, you know, about the value of this water bottle, right? And so you can buy those shares pretty easily. But as you create value, now it's no longer the water bottle, it's, you know, value of a small house. For you to buy those shares costs real money in order to, to own them. And so it's really helpful to get those key players in place early on. There's a significant economic value for them to having ownership versus options. Sometimes you'll provide a smaller equity grant in exchange for the fact that it's priced low and they can own the shares. Okay? And um, the challenge is, though, while early on there, you know, the value of this water bottle, you quickly get into this regime I forgot the name of the section of the law, but foreign INAs, right? Anyone ever hear the term foreign INA? Anyone? I know a few have. It's kind of a cockamamie scheme uh, where you're supposed to hire an outside firm to value your business, right? What's the value of a startup, right? You, I mean, think about the range you might get in terms of term sheets from an investor, and let alone someone's going to come up with the value. But the tax code requires you to make a good faith effort to figure this stuff out because they don't want people undervaluing their shares for the purposes of avoiding taxes. So, um, Yeah, and now let's show how, how we get from a few salient terms to legal documents without a squadron of lawyers up here. <laughs> so I've been walking through it as, uh, as we've been talking. Um, here I've actually executed uh, the founder's agreement, which defines how the Founder shares uh, deal with restriction and transfer and all these rights. So we can take a look at that one. I don't know if Steve, you want to mention anything about that? Um, no, I mean they're pretty straightforward. I mean, when someone starts a company and they don't have one of these, when they go get institutional financing, one will be retroactively applied, typically, right? And there are good uh, sources for these documents. We were able to look at something like Founders Workbench. There's that good one, Proctor. 
um, puts out there, and there's a number of great sources for. You don't have the documents. all the fields. You already went through that. I did. But there are things in there like you might, you know, can you transfer shares, you know, to your spouse, to your kids, to your parent, you know, family members, and again, these things get standardized. They don't want you transferring shares to parties outside. I mean, they don't mind you doing it for like estate planning, but they don't want you going out just selling shares to random people, right? Because they want you incented to build the business. And so again, these things get put in place. They're not scary, right? I mean, one of the biggest things we're also trying to do here is try to help people understand what's typical, right? By actually capturing what, you know, if you knew that, just like when you do an end user license agreement on a site, you know, you don't read it. It's like, well, there's millions of people clicking on this, so it's fine. If you knew that this founder's agreement was used by the past 500 companies that were venture backed in the Boston area, be like, okay, I don't have to worry about all this stuff. It, this is what I'm going to have to do, so just do it and move forward. Right? In fact, that's largely what I did early on. I didn't know what all this stuff was. And over time, they show up on, you know, in a recurring fashion, and you start to figure out what all these pieces actually mean. But I wouldn't say that was a good use of time, figuring that out. I mean, my hope is that we can make this so that fewer and fewer people have to actually know what's in these things. Right? So. You, you created so that, that was the complete. That was that. So go to the data room and bring and show them. So he just basically he created the company and then he just created the, some founders agreements and you can see them. So, oh, we can see the board consents. Yeah, we can take a look at that. So this was the the first board consent. I mean, you could you know, and there's all the stuff you could try to learn about how boards are run and whatnot. But some of the stuff is just boilerplate. So here he just generated all this stuff where. There was a board meeting, and yes, you would have had to have a board meeting. When you click on it, you kind of certify that you actually did this stuff and whatnot. But he created the, you know, Jason looks, he's the president, he's the treasurer, the secretary. You know, there's a stock certificate that exists. But this is all the stuff that, that's done that, you know, you don't want to spend any time on because it's not advancing your actual business. It's just stuff that allows you to operate. And the simpler you can make it, the better off you are. Now, of course, there will come a time when the board matters a lot, but not yet. So the whole point now is minimize it. It's boilerplate at this point. Later it'll be strategic, but so far not. You want to find legal counsel to be your strategic advisor and help you make good decisions, provide advice, and, and all those pieces. That's, that's really what you want legal counsel for. And they're usually valuable to your success, but it's trying to leverage them in the most efficient way possible so they can provide as much value as possible. Is there another document you want to see, Steve? Um, well, the point is, what we, what we realized is every time you created documents with someone, they ended up in your email or in a shoebox, a file cabinet, this kind of stuff. So the point of this platform was the workflows are right in it. And when you create the actual document, they never leave the data room. So the, the concept of a data room doesn't make sense anymore because it is the company. Right? Otherwise, what happens every time you have a transaction, you're scrambling to get everything cleaned up and put into a data room, going through your emails, going through the file cabinets. Whereas this, you just do it, you know, do it, you know, once it's, you know, you do it, it's done, right? And it's in the right place. So. Yeah, and, and this goes back to the process, the idea that the documents begin in isolation, but they start to have dependencies. So you could already see complexity popping up, and so this is where, you, you start to run a process to keep track of things and interdependencies. And at this stage in the company, you can do this you know, w with a normal filing system. In 12 years, um, it becomes impossibly complex, but it's a starter. Well, we had a big legal team that dealt with it at that point. Yeah. So, so um, let's go to the next. Yeah, maybe is there anyone from the audience who's, um, who, who wants to come up who's been through um, so, some of this early stage work. Like an angel financing where they had done a debt note, something like that? Anybody? That's all right. We, I can come up with the, the scenario. Is, who knows what um, an angel financing or debt finan uh, you know, a note financing is in an early stage company? Anybody? Yeah. You want to? Microphone out to you. Oh, you know, okay. So. So one of the challenges that you always have when you're getting your initial financing is what's the value of the business? Right? What does someone pay per share? And 
it's all, you know, so, so one, it could be many different things. And oftentimes, it's, they're, they're your friends or it's family, and you don't want to set it with them. You want some third party, but you're not ready to engage that third party. Uh, the other thing that's going on very early on is you're creating a ton of value very rapidly. Right? You're going from zero to something that hopefully is material. And so what evolved over the past 15 years, in fact, when we started in DECA, it was very cutting edge for us to use it. We had a, a debt note in 1999. And the idea was I've raised, I think, $2 million on it. And the folks that put money on it, basically the price, whatever our, our first round of financing was, they got to invest that money at a 20% discount. And then we had a cap in it. And in fact, they ended up investing at about, I mean, the cap was like 15 million. And we actually raised money at a 30 million pre. And so you know, they, they, they paid about half the price per share as the venture investors that came in. And in 1999, it was the height of the internet bubble. So $15 million valuations for startups for less than 10 people were almost non-existent. So the angel funders assumed that you know, when they did the note that they would be you know, putting money in at a, you know, for a two or $3 million valuation. So that's where you can get real leverage early on by not setting the price and hope that things Yeah, we just happen well. to create a lot of value very quickly. Um, but one of the challenges with these notes is you generate a lot of paperwork, OK? And I mean, I know of an entrepreneur that did a, a $2 million financing. And I'm trying to remember how much of it was in notes, but he did a lot of like $10,000 notes. I think he ended up spending $200,000 in fees just to clean up all of this stuff when he did his financing. OK, so think about that. 10% of the money he was raising ended up going to cleaning up this stuff, um, which is nuts. And so what we wanted to do was, how do you drive down the cost of this so that, you know what, someone can invest $5,000 if they want. And you don't, you don't pay a penalty with all the excess paperwork around that. And it turns out there's a standard set of terms that people care about. And um, you know, as Jason has up there, you can see them here, right? How much are you trying to raise? Is it multiple closings? You can do it once, or is it going to be, you know, there's a term called salami financing, where it's in slices, you keep going, right? Um, the, um, you know, there's an interest rate. Again, there's, there's sort of defaults, which is basically what's typical at any point in time. And, you know, what you want to, we want to do is have it, you can sit with a legal counsel who understands these terms and the implications, and you're kind of figuring out what, you know, how do I want it set up? But you shouldn't care too much about the actual wording of it, right? The wording should be able to be standardized as to what's acceptable and, it, you know, and has been tried and true multiple times. And again, by automating it on top of where we've already done the articles of incorporation, et cetera, we have all that other information to be able to continue driving more standardization. So, so go through some terms. Like, wh which terms do you see people? monkeying around with and trying to get creative when they should really just be playing with boilerplate? Well, the, the, ones, the, the ones that really matter, OK, is a and, discount rate. How many of these have you done, would you say? In I've probably been involved 30 of them, probably, I would guess, right? But there's a discount rate. There's a cap, which may or may not be there, depending on you know, kind of the leverage and how interesting the investment is, if you're going to have more demand for investment than, uh, uh, than supply. So do discount rate. To, uh, the discount rate, I mean, 20% is what's typical, right? And now, if you're later stage and you do something like this, which is a bridge, you might have a smaller discount rate. But that's kind of the, you know. Does, it, does everyone get what the discount rate is? Basically, if let's, let's say I'm, I provide $100,000 on this note, and the company ultimately is going to raise money from a venture firm at a dollar a share. My hundred thousand dollars instead is turned is is bought is uh, invested at eighty cents a share. Okay, that's the point of the discount because I was in there early. I took on more risk. You know, that's that's the basic idea. Now, a couple of other really important terms, right, that are often overlooked. Well, let me pause you. And the big benefit is, as an entrepreneur working with angels, and the angels are friends and family, maybe colleagues. You know, it's it's very difficult to them to claim some sort of valuation, right? To say, I think my company is worth $3 million um, when it's just you know, an idea and some hard work. And this is a way to 
punt that entire discussion down the road into the future and say, we can let the market set what the actual valuation is, and for now, we don't have to worry about that. And for, for taking that risk, the, you, you know, you get some discount. But there's a couple insidious terms that I'd say most entrepreneurs don't appreciate how insidious they are. And that is whether that person on this note, what rights they have in terms of the actual equity financing. So let's say someone gives you 500K in a note, but they get a right to 50% of your equity financing. Okay. So let's say you, let's say you raise $2 million on a note and your plan is to do a $10 million Series A. Someone puts in 500K, you know, it's a venture firm, and they say, hey, we want rights to 50% of the Series A. Makes it really hard for you to create a competitive dynamic. Right? They're, not gonna, they're not gonna be competing. They're just gonna wait for someone else. They got the other half of the round. You take that term out, if they wanna be in, in the deal, they're gonna have to compete. Okay? Makes for a very different set of outcomes. Right? So you gotta be really careful with those, what those investment rights are. When you do a Series A, it's very, at that point, typical, people typically have what's called pro rata investment rights. Anyone want to speak what pro rata investment rights are? Anybody? OK, yes. Um, yeah, pro rata, basically, like it's the right to, in the follow-on round, um, like buy up so that you maintain your stake. Yeah. So if I own 10% of the company, and you're going to go raise you know, $50 million for another 50% of the company, right? If I want to maintain my 10%, I get to whatever the dollars are. It's you know, been a long day. I can't do the math. But you, know, you can keep going. And that's, and that's typical once you're in equity rounds. But on the, the, on the notes, it's, I mean, you, it's, a, it's a negotiation. right? And if you have the leverage, right? but, it's, but that's one of those terms that people probably don't think is important. They just kind of like, oh, it's just the pricing, discount. That's what I care about. That one's really important. So, so I'm working with a company right now. And uh, so you know, typically, a venture firm, they're giving you money, but they're also giving you their time. And their time is probably more scarce than their money to them. So to them, it takes just as much time to spend, um, you know, to take 3% of the company as to take 20% of the company. They're, you know, one is more money, but they're both about the same amount of time. So for to them, they don't want to bother for less than 10%. Um, yeah, how many have you, I mean, there's this, this, this idea of venture capital math, okay, which kind of determines mostly where valuations come from and whatnot. And the, and, the, and the math starts with, I'm a partner at a venture fund. I've raised a certain amount of money. I have three years to invest it. I have to invest X dollars a year, right? You could see how that math might work, right? So you have, let's say I had $100 million, and I've got three years to invest it, and it's just me. So I've got $33 million a year to invest. How many deals can I realistically be involved with? Eight, let's, let's, let's go with eight. Let's do nine, let's make it easy. That's three deals a year, right? So if I'm doing three deals a year, that means I got, let's say, $30 million, so $10 million per deal, right? I don't want to do all of it up front. I got to save some for maintaining my pro rata rights, so I get to, okay, I'll do up to $5 million, okay? And then this, the rest is reserves if I'm doing a Series A. That's venture capital math, okay? Well, now, if I can only be on eight boards, I mean, I want to be involved in things that, I'm going to have a material stake in. I'm not going to do 1% investments in eight places. I'm not going to be able to put all that to work. right? So for the longest time, the way venture capital math worked, and this was, I'd say, 80s, 90s. It's, more recently, it's, it's probably changed a little bit. But two firms would come in on a deal, and they would take 30 to 40% to get you to, to your first big milestone, which is typically you've got a product and you're entering the market. And then you're raising a second round, basically, to scale the business, which is another you know, 30% split between a, a new firm coming in and people keeping their pro rata rights. You know, that was the kind of the typical sort of thing. Nowadays, the funds have gotten bigger, so someone might just take a 25% stake. But the way valuations are typically created is someone looks at how much money you want, and they got to get their reasonable stake. Unless you're a very unusual company, like you know, you're a Facebook and you're showing like these adoption numbers like that, then you can go to Jim Breyer and say, I want a $100 million valuation, and I don't have any clue on how I'm going to generate revenue. Right? But you know, those, shouldn't, those aren't the things you can benchmark off of. You can't use the you know, five or six sigma situations as your, as your benchmark. You have to go with what's the, 
what's typical. And, and part of that is, and I'll get to you in one second, venture capitalists, they don't know which of those eight, so let's say I built that portfolio of those, of those nine companies. I rarely know a priori which is gonna be the big winner. I'm expecting one of those nine is gonna be a big winner. You know, so one's a home run, two or three are gonna be doubles or triples, another two or three are kind of singles, and the rest I lose money on. But you don't, you don't know up front, because if you knew up front, obviously you wouldn't be investing in the ones that you're gonna lose money on, right? And you can be surprised. And so the whole theory is, if I got 20% in each of these, and one of them's a big hit, it's gonna cover all those losses for you know, the ones that don't work out. So, yes? Who's making the evaluation of the company? So, like, I want uh, to, like, how do you decide how much money you want to recruit and how much percentage are you giving away? Yeah. For instance, if it's like three partners or so everyone has 33%, it goes well, 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 down to. Well, there's a couple of things. One, how you separate between partners, that's a separate, that was what we were trying to talk about before, which is you got to assess the relative strengths that people are bringing, you know, the, the, what, what are the assets that they're bringing. But you gotta build a business plan, right? And a business plan, I'm not saying a 100 page document. I'm saying an Excel spreadsheet, which is sort of, this is how much, these are the people I'm gonna hire, right? This is what their salaries are gonna be. This is what my expenses are. So this is, and I'm gonna need this many months to get this thing built. Or this many months to get my first you know, 10,000 subscribers. Whatever, whatever it is you're trying to accomplish with that big milestone, okay? You figure out how much money do you need and that's what you're talking to investors about. So I need $6 million to build this product and get my first 10 customers, okay? So I'm out there trying to raise $6 million. And it's gonna take me two years, right, to get to that product built, those customers there. And venture capital math largely determines it's gonna be somewhere between 30 and 40% of the equity of the company. That would be the, I'd say, you know, within two standard deviations or, or something like that, this kind of covers it. If you have more assets, a more experienced team, you bring some IP into it, it's a particularly hot space, you're gonna be on the low side of that. Otherwise, you're on the high side of that. I mean, it's, it really is that. And then you try to create competition with several firms. If you create competition, well then you're gonna Im improve those terms. And typically what you do is rather than reduce their percent ownership, maybe you raise $8 million for that same percent. Okay, so you have more runway, you have more margin for error in, in your plan. Anyone else? Okay. And um, let's generate some legal documents. <laughs> so I can go through this bridge note process, and it actually generates a lot of documents. Steve wasn't kidding about that. Um, but the truth of the matter is you want to understand what the business terms are, because those are the things that are going to drive the financials of what really matters out of these things. And then it's more a conversation with your legal counsel around your strategy and making sure that you're protected and all the documents are, are kosher. And one of the things we're hoping also by doing this session is to get any feedback on terms of, you know, it's often the case that if you're in the process of starting a business, you have the least awareness to these all these issues that come up, right? And so we're trying to just provide some exposure but then get feedback from people as to what would make it you know, more useful for them, right? The site's not live yet. You can't just go on and use it, but. So when you're creating those documents and you kind of you know, take the mouse to one of the terms, is there a glossary that pops up so for some people? There will be, it's, it's a piece, I mean, it's kind of in development, but yes, absolutely. It's how do you make this as helpful? Now, the thing is the system can't give you any legal advice, right? Not allowed to do that, but um, we can simplify things as much as possible. And is there any plan to port it also to other jurisdictions like Canada or, you know? Yeah. Once we, I mean, we're working on, so the challenge of building a product like this is it's sort of like SAP. SAP has this crazy schema for like any type of business. And so we're kind of building that now. And then in other jurisdictions, it's just adding in the specific, you know, legal language and, you know, it's, it's kind of tuning it up a bit. You want to talk about? Oh, go ahead. Um, two quick questions on the on the angel bridge note. Is that the way it's always done nowadays? Like typically, when you go with angels, they'll always just offer you the. the no, that's not true at all. There are plenty of situations where someone will price an equity financing, um, you know, for the angel investors. Right? You might say, "Look, I need 100k. It's for 10 percent of the business, because you know I got to eat and you know that sort of thing." So 
Okay. What's your recommendation on valuation in that scenario? It's hard. I mean, it's so contextual, right? Um, you know, the more desperate you are for financing, the lower the valuation is going to be, right? If you've saved up some money, then you're going to be in a better spot to create some value. But if you absolutely need to pay two people to get your prototype built, which is going to lead to the other financing, well, that's you got to do what you got to do, right? And as an angel, how, how do you how would you think about that? How would you think about going between those two options? Like, what motivates you to choose one over the other? Every every person's going to have a different philosophy. My philosophy is, I should be an enabler to create a much bigger pie, right, versus trying to maximize the piece of pie that I'm getting as the investor, right? That's just, you know, I, I believe in trying to motivate that team as much as possible versus creating lots of dilution early on, right? But because if it's successful, it's not going to matter, right, at the end of the day. So. I think all valuations are market driven. You can come up with an extrinsic valuation or a bottoms up valuation, but the truth is, it's like bidding on eBay. You know, unless there's multiple parties, the price is going to be the asking price or nothing. And so, so that's the key: is you want competition. But the thing is, it's it's completely unknown. And that's why I say, if you look at a venture capitalist portfolio, they can't tell you which ones are the losers, right? So, what's the right price? It's it's just there's, it's become a convention, right? The amount of money to get to your big milestone is thirty to forty percent. When you're taking money from an angel, what other than the money do you typically ask of them, expect from them, you know, have them sort of offer you other than just sort of cash? Well, the question is, what do you expect from one of those early investors? Okay. And again, it's context. There's some investors, if you can't, I mean, your ideal is you're going to get someone who can invest as an angel, who can also do your, you know, do your big round of financing later on. That's the perfect scenario. But you can't always do that. You know, for example, you know, when I, my early angel investors, I had guys like Dick Parsons when he was president at Time Warner, right, before he became uh, chairman of, uh, of Citigroup. I had, uh, and Time Warner was part of, you know, AOL was in there. So you know, he was able to open the door at AOL and way back when. We didn't get a deal, but still he opened the door. Um, I had the chief investment officer from Putnam. And he got his IT team to figure out how to use our software, which actually was huge for us in terms of figuring out the markets we're going after, right? So you can get some really value-add angel investors, and there are others that did nothing, right? They just wrote a check, and they did very well in the end. But You know, I, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're saying a lot of your valuation comes not from your idea, but who's on your team, right? So who's betting with their skin to quit their job to join you? So, for example, you know, for Jason at Shoebox, if the... COO of Goodwin Proctor, massive law firm, were to quit and join Shoebox, their value would increase. Well, in the meantime, maybe you can't get him on the team, but if he's an angel investor, um, that's a start. It's, it's a way to show your later funders that there are people betting with their skin. There's a, there's a term I use about building a business, and it's this relentless pursuit of credibility. And you know, because it's just an idea, it's, it's, which, you know, and what's it, what's it worth? Does it mean anything? It's, it's, is it credible that that idea is going to be made to happen? Now, once you start making it happen, you start having assets, you start having customers, you have product, you have all this other stuff. But along the way, so you start out, it's just your own credibility, right? And then it's either the investors you bring in or the team you bring in. That's where the next set of credibility comes in. Like, I look back to my old slides. It was all about who the investors were. And at some point, it just becomes about who the customers are. So we've done some salient terms. There's a lot of boilerplate we're thankfully not talking about. Let's do multiple closings. OK. So when you, you know, in, in, this, in this note construct, the idea is if you had to organize all of the different investors in the note on the same day, that's a lot of work, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to do, and you're invariably only going to have a few investors. So what's very common is you create a note. I can raise up, like when I did mine, I could raise up to $2 million. I close the first 600000 then the next 400000 in the first you know, sort of week. And then I went after, and those were two venture firms. And then I went after these individuals for hundred k at a time and over the next three months. Okay, And at some point, we filled it out. 
and by then we kind of knew who was going to be our, our Series A invest, investor. And um, you know, we eventually you know, converted all those notes into equity. So is there a way to bring, did you show the doc that you created with the bridge note? We can do that. Right now I have the reps and warranties open. I don't know if you want to make a comment. Okay, yeah. So who knows what reps and warranties are? <laughs> so That's why I thought it was a good the idea, the idea is you as the CEO or a person signing these documents are representing and warranting certain things to be true. So classic one, there are no lawsuits against the company, right? That would be one. Or you are, you know, you are who you say you are, you know, and you, you have the right to do this, or you know, it's it's things like that. Is there some that you want to call out there? Or? Some of it's defining the capitalization of the company. Yeah. Some of these are just the facts and right. figures, right? You're saying this is a company registered in Delaware that has this many shares that were issued on this date at this price. These are the registered shareholders. It's all that data that in this case was already captured by this system, just being regurgitated in another document, right? That's you're, ba you're basically letting the investor know what the current status of your universe is. Do you have pending litigation? Did you, what material contracts do you have? Do you have some partner that's the majority of your business or something? Like all these things need to be out on the table if you're gonna be getting money from an investor. So and they'll hold you to it later if you can don't. Can you show the scope of the full document at this point? The scope. I want to give people a sense for how much paperwork you just generated with a few clicks. <laughs> Sure. So this is the note purchase agreement itself. So it's the main overarching document. How many pages is that? So these also include some of the exhibits. So if you actually had something here, but some yeah, some of the stuff isn't filled out. But in a typical case, that that one alone is like forty pages of stuff that was generated. If you look across the documents you created for this debt offering, is about a hundred page of documentation, hundred pages, right? And the thing is, you don't want to be reading through all that stuff, right? Like you just have better things to do if you're building a business. And so again, as much as possible, if we can help you know this is standard boilerplate, here's your specifics that have been inserted, you know, these are the terms you know, that were machine generated and put in there, it's hopefully gonna make people's lives better. So. so the board and shareholders. Yeah, back there. So, so if you run into an angel or a VC that does have particular terms that are outside of this system, yep. how are you able to adjust those, those contracts? Do you have to do that outside of Shoebox? Or are you well, there's two ways. One, the, the, you know, when this is live, the company will be able to rapidly, re, lap, rapidly respond to incorporate new terms into the workflow. Right? That's part of it. Two, you can always add an amendment to any of these things. Right? You can always upload an amendment which says this part that says this is now this. Right? But what we're trying to do is make, though, a little bit of a bar that it's not just going right into a word processor and changing things. You make it too easy to change. Like when I went between my two rounds of financing, I had someone go through and change every reference to the word Delaware to state of Delaware, to give you an example. Because it was ambiguous that this company that was incorporated in the state of Delaware, Delaware might refer to something else. And so I had to, that was part of the markups that I had to wade through when I was going through this, which is just nuts, right? So You know, we, we just talked about how you would do it in shoebox, but more importantly, the question is, how would you ever do it? And, and the answer is, you, Usually you shouldn't. Um, so you need to coach your investors that they shouldn't do that unless they're adding value in some way. They can't just make it different. They have to. But, but, but of course, it's all about the leverage better. you've got, right? It's all about I mean, the leverage you've got. The masters. Of, did you, I mean, did you work in private equity or something like that? Or yeah, private mm -hmm. equity is the masters of coming up with all these assets, constantly innovating on terms. Right? That's why you have companies that go public from private equity and are still paying fees 20 years later back to the private equity firms. But yes, this won't work for private equity. This will work for basically new companies going the route of more traditional growth capital. Right. Yes? Does the, uh, does the reps and warranties allow only, VC or only your founders to hold you accountable to what you've stated, or does it also allow other parties like your customers to hold you accountable to it? what you've said in the context of a C-Corp? Well, so the reps and warranties are for the investors in this context, okay? When you do a contract with a customer, you might make representation and warranties in that contract, right? And so the people, there's certain people that sign the reps and warranties. Usually it's the, you know, the CEO, you know, it um, might be other founders. It might be just anyone over a certain ownership position. I mean, there's a number of different ways you can do it, right? But the, the point is someone is on the hook if they're lying about this stuff, 
right? And the first time you do that, it's kind of scary. You're kind of like, wow, I mean, you know, you're being really careful. You're really worried about this. And really what they're trying to do is avoid someone who's a fraud, who's making stuff up and presenting things that aren't really true, okay? Or hiding something, okay? That's, that's the whole point of reps and warranties. Um, that said, when you go through it the first time, it's like, I mean, I'm legally liable for this thing and all that kind of stuff. And so you really think about it. But, um, but it's, it's meant to be pretty straightforward. And, and then when you think about, you know, a LLC or a C Corp are both supposed to protect or give you something to an extent. The shareholders like, get protection. Yeah. You as an executive, though, making representations, though, could be personally liable if you're lying and making fraudulent representations. You know, and they could sue you as an individual. The shareholders could sue you for ma making a false representation. Right? Unless you're a big bank, then you're kind of shielded from all that. So, personal responsibility. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, this is Bridge Note Boil Plate will cover the situation where a venture capital firm actually decides to invest in your, uh, in your company as a uh, seed round, uh, where essentially it's a, seat, it's a bridge note that would have the uh, potential to get it to basically move. Uh can you repeat it? I want to make sure I understand the question. Does this boil play for Bridge Note cover the cases where it's a venture capital firm that invests in your uh, company? Absolutely. A absolutely. The, the thing is, there's a set of document documents that were created by the National Venture Capital Association to try to standardize this as much as possible. And so what you're seeing is those documents put into a workflow for the most part. So it's not anything that's you know, out of left field. Anyone else? Can we continue? So, so this is the certificate of the secretary. I don't even know what that one does. It's a secretary certificate, Steve. I'm sure you signed a few. <laughs> so, so it's just an organization of all the documents that approved it. So you have to present the bylaws. You have to get board approval. All your shareholders need to approve the action. So you basically need to get your, all the people that have invested in the company thus far to actually line up behind the action you're about to take. And this document goes on forever and ever. You have to get standing with Delaware to make sure that's still kosher, but it's yeah. I mean, this is this is to do it where you're dotting all the I's, crossing all the T's. Right. Now, one of the things that's happened with a lot of these angel notes was, you know what? It's a few hundred thousand dollars. It's not worth doing all this stuff for that, and so they cut a lot of corners, and that's fine. But if we do it in software, we don't have to cut the corners. We can do the full thing, and it's kind of just it's you know it's one and the same. Yes. So does the website also give you information? So if I request it, I want to do this. So it's going to come up with, if you want to do this, this is what you need to do. Like the workflow kind of a thing. And these are the documents. Like wizards. Like, 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 because like, yeah. I don't know what I need to do in order to kind of cover yep. all the bases. Right? Mm -hmm. So if I want to raise money or if I want to do whatever, here's ABC, this will be kind of a thing. Yeah, I have no doubt this over time will have background information. It, it can't provide advice necessarily. And what it's meant is for you to work with someone who's experienced, but automate all the mechanics of it, right? Like it's not going to tell you what you should be doing as your board resolution necessarily. I mean, it sort of does, but it gives you a choice. You, you know, it won't tell you that you need to do this board re resolution right now. Well, in some cases it does if it's part of another workflow. But it makes it so that when you decide you want to do X, you can automate the boilerplate. So. Yes. Um, you mentioned that this is still in development. Yep. Um, for those of us that are looking to incorporate like this in, over the next couple months, let's say, is Founders Workbench? Founders Workbench is a very good resource. But you know what? If you reach out to Shoebox, there's a, is there a login? Is there a, an email there? You put in your email for when it's live. We're going to start giving private beta invitations to this so that people can start using it, hopefully, throughout the spring. Right, for the, this academic cycle of companies, some of them will be able to take advantage of it. I mean, we're using it now. I mean, I'm dog fooding it in a few places, you know, and you know, finding lots of bugs and all this stuff, but you know, as you'd expect. So where are we now? Yeah, so um, we have one third section. We did formation and angel funding, and we're gonna do early hires now, which is a really interesting part of the discussion because it's probably the most strategic. We really get into cap table in a, in a meaningful way for the first time. So before we go forward to that, any last questions about founding or angel funding? Yeah. Before you raise any money, including angel funding, is it good to go through? At what point should you go through this? Should you incorporate before even your very first angel investment? Or well, 
I mean, you kind of have to, right? If they're going to invest, you got to have an entity for them to invest in, right? Right, but I guess some angel investors that I know, like, they like to do it kind of. Well, here's the thing. Your advantage of having incorporated before that investment's coming in is you're going to be able to do your founder's shares for you know, very inexpensively. If you start doing all of this at the same time, well, now there's being, there's, it, you start getting into this nexus where, are those shares really cheap? There's already money in the company or it's already been agreed upon? Like, yeah. And so typically you want to start something, get that done, and then have money come in with some distance between. You definitely want to have some form of legal entity. And you'd want to get legal counsel if you're not doing that because you could run into issues. So, but again, you want to make you know, the cost of doing that as low as possible. You don't have anything. You don't have any people. You don't have any money. You don't have any product. You don't want to be spending a lot of your time on paperwork because that's not going to actually materially change your circumstances on people, money, or, well, it helps with the money because you got to have this stuff to, as an enabler to be able to raise capital. But creating an entity is like, it's a $100 transaction. It's not, it's not a ton of money to do that. So, um, it's just a flow. So when, you, when you're hiring someone, what do you, anyone have any idea what you need to have in place to sort of legally hire someone? Do it properly. Anyone want to volunteer kind of with some thoughts on that? Nobody? OK, we got to volunteer. You guys, I guess you had to be uh, C-Cop before you hire the. You got to have what? You had to be incorporated before. Yep, you have to be incorporated, sure. Well. You have a non-disclosure, right? You're going to share secrets with a person. You don't want them to be able to go tell other people, right? Because you got this great, great idea and all these secrets and the special sauce that you're making, right? Anyone who's ever worked at a startup, think back to when you were signing things. What do you remember? Yeah, Simon, I like intellectual property. To the yep. What happens if you don't do that? Basically, the intellectual property belong to the old company. That well, let's, so let's say, let's say I joined your company. And you didn't have me sign an IP agreement, and I'm working on some of the code, and then you fire me, right? And I say I want my code back, right? And you're like, no, it's it's mine. I'm like, well, I didn't give it to you. Where's the agreement? And you could get into a you know an ugly fight. Even worse would be I say nothing, and I wait until you're really successful, and then I say you know, and you just sold the company for a billion dollars, and out of the woodwork. I show up and I'm like, hey, I have some ownership of that IP. So right? we, we spent weeks tracking down people um, with missing. Yeah, and it's, I mean, we probably had them. Just, there were 1,500 people employed over the years. And you know what? There's always going to be some miss rate or something gets lost. So non disclosure, invention assignments, then it's their, you know, it would be their equity agreements. What's the term of their vesting? If you didn't get, you know what? There are people who they'll, they'll do the option agreement and they'll leave out the vesting. That's not good. All right. So who else remembers signing something? Do people just sign? <laughs> it might be a non-compete, right? Depending on the state you're in and all this kind of stuff, right? And sometimes you're looking for those documents years later, right? So, so but that's just the legal stuff. Let's talk about how do you, you know, what do you compensate someone early on in one of these companies? Or let's say here's a scenario: you're, um, you know, three founders. You were part of a business plan competition. Uh, you won the prize. You have a little bit of money to hire someone. Um, what what feels like a fair equity grant? Fire away. Um, I it's depending on who, but. Sub five for sure, maybe like half a half a point to a point, or oh, sorry, half a percent to a percent. Oh, what? Anyone else? Just curious, like your gut feel, like what would, you know, it's the first person in the room besides the first three of you. What what would come to the top of your head is, you know, the the right equity grant. Usually one percent or one percent. Yep. So, the first thing that we really should be asking ourselves is more the context. Yep. Okay, if you're paying this someone a full salary, it's different than if they're getting sweat equity, right? Two, what, what does this person bring? Are they the office manager or are they going to be contributing unique IP that's going to make or break this business actually happening? Okay, another is what's the likely dilution that's going to happen over the course of this company, right? If you're coming out of the gates really strong, 
right? Well, it's going to be smaller offers because there's going to be less dilution, right? Like you bootstrapped it for a period of time or, you know, whatever. And so, you know, a lot of these formulas, again, they assume the average company. And a lot of times, I mean, yes, people are building the average company. Sometimes, though, you're building a below average company, right? Or you might be building an above average one. And, and, just, and below average doesn't mean um, it's a bad company. It just means that, you know what, it's going to be a $100 million outcome, right? Versus, you know, the expected cases, say, a $500 million or a billion dollar outcome. And that's why I, I, I don't like a lot of these rules of thumb because they just work on averages and it takes away all the unique context that each of these businesses have. So, you know, just like the folks, if you're working in food, if you were coming up with new food products, it's probably a different context than if you're coming up with some crazy machine learning thing, right? It's gonna be a different talent pool that you're recruiting from, et cetera. So, but it's very common for some of the early, like the classic innovation economy company is, Okay, there's some founders, and now you're getting some of your key technical people, and they're going to see a point or two, you know, if it's before the financing, and then that gets diluted down to, you know, if they're very senior to kind of a point, or it might be a quarter point, or again, it's going to depend on the context of that individual. And then you have your leadership team is the other big thing that you got to budget for. So th this is key, you know, it's a point of what. So it, let's step back for a minute, and usually you'll have three pools, right? The founder shares, the funder shares and the employee shares. And do you want to talk yeah, about so that? Yeah, so when, when, when you take outsider financing, what they're going to do is insist that you create an option pool, which is a certain percent of the capitalization of the company. Okay, And that option pool, if, it's think of it as a budget to hire the kind of people that you're going to need to make this successful. Now, depending on who the founders are and the people already there, the budget, like what's, so let's say the founding team includes a very credible VP of development, includes a credible CEO, includes a credible CFO, well, the budget's going to be smaller because you don't have to bring those people in. On the other hand, if you don't have any of that, the kind of standard would be like a 16 to 20% that you're going to need as a budget because you're going to need that to hire all these people. Okay? And that becomes a pretty material term when you're doing a equity financing. Right? It's uh, 16 or 20% of the total pool or of the employee pool? 16 to 20% of the total capitalization of the company. So if there's, you know, a million shares, right? What, let's, say, let's say there was uh, 800,000 shares in the company. They would say you've got to hold another 200,000 for a 20% option pool. Of, you know, so of a million, it's 20%. Okay? And then eventually you run out of that pool, and then you have to increase it. Right? And, you know, and one of the terms of, these, of the shareholder agreements is how, what's the, the voting threshold and who gets to vote to approve such things. And that's one of the protections for investors. Otherwise, founders could be like, hey, I'll just vote a bigger pool and give myself a lot of shares. I have control of the board, all this kind of stuff. And that's what the protections in these documents do, is to create some balance of power between you know, anyone exploiting the other party, the other shareholders. Okay. Questions on that? Is this helpful? Interesting? I mean, we're kind of just rambling up here. so. <laughs> And we can keep going in many different directions. Question over here. Yes. I have a question, kind of a little bit of combined with founder and the whole shareholding and employee thing. It's about if you're a foreigner and you're on a visa. Ah. Do you guys have any comments on that? Like, can you be a founder? I mean, you can't just be an employee, obviously, if you're not having the well, I mean, right visa. So, because I haven't, OK, someone here. We have the exact same issue. We're, we're both co-founders, and we're on student visas. Um, and I don't know, it seems to us that we have to have someone else who's like the... The American? Yeah, basically signing, <laughs> signing everything. Um, but doesn't necessarily have to have shares, but like maybe their interest is, like they want to have a stake in it without being like... Yeah, this is a classic one to talk to an attorney on this. In fact, I know people, I know founders who basically got their visas because they created the business and raised financing and all that kind of stuff. So I don't see any reason, I mean... Again, I'm not a lawyer, but you don't have to be a citizen to be able to be an investor or a creator of a company, I think, in the, you know, in the U.S. I don't think that's the so, case. So for the first two acts here, we've restricted ourselves to Delaware law. And this is the first section where we go um, not just international, but state by state with employment law. So the, the whole ball of wax just you know, 
became 50 yeah, times Although this has immigration law tied into it yep, as well. So. Exactly. But so th this is where outside counsel and part-time CFOs probably come. Or you find an entrepreneur that went through that. See, none of us went through that, so I can't give you the first-hand experience, right? But I know entrepreneurs who have, and I think there's a pretty well-worn path on what you want to do. I mean, it should be advantageous if you're trying to become a citizen or a green card, that sort of stuff. So, yeah, Until now, you could do quite a bit on your own. And this is really the stage in the life cycle of the company where risk starts to compound. And it's, it's time to, to get more advice. Yes, right here. Yeah. OK, so when you were choosing your angel investors or trying to select who they'd be, how would you go about doing that? Do you have to have personal connections with these people, or do you have this idea of, oh, I would love this person to invest, and how are you going to go about contacting them? Yeah, well, well, it's all of the above, right? So the question was, how do you find your angel investors, right? It's, and it's not so much, I mean, choose is part of it, but it's usually find, right? So it's by hook or crook, you're out there talking to people. You meet someone who finds what you're doing interesting. It's like, oh, you got to talk to Bob and Mary. And you talk to Bob and Mary because they were in that industry, and they're really excited by it. And, you say, would you like to invest? And they're interested. Now, there are others. You're like, I really need this particular person, right? And then you, you know, literally, you go and hunt. I mean, that's that's what entrepreneurship is about, right? The, one of the, I think Solomon likes to use this phrase, right? It's the pursuit of resources beyond your current control, right? Entrepreneurship. Well, that's what you do. You go. I mean, and there were there were some people I found that way, but most of them were, you know, relationships that were prior or someone along the way said, oh, you got to talk to these other folks. We have some other hands that were just up. Yes, back there. Yeah. One more question. The, um, any suggestions on the, the right balance between the cap table and the per share value for, uh, during the incorporation? Um, there's some boilerplate stuff there, right? So when you think of the, when you're creating, it's basically the question when you're creating the company, how many shares should you have, right? The share value, you're just going to be as low as you're allowed to go because there's no assets, right? I mean, if you're. Why do you want to keep it low? Well, you want to keep it low so you can buy those shares. Right? Now, on the other hand, if all those early folks, if the founders are creating the capital that's going to build the business, then you're going to have those, that share price to be much higher. Right? Everything I've been saying assumes that someone else, there's going to be preferred shareholders contributing capital. The founders are contributing you know, their labor. Right? Um, but you, what's interesting is the number of shares. Right? You get into some funky stuff at some point around how Delaware calculates taxes and all this kind of stuff that I can't even remember all the idiosyncrasies. But you actually want a, quite a large number of shares. And the reason why is when you're hiring people, very few people actually understand how all this stuff works. Okay? And even if you try to explain it to folks, they're still not going to understand it. And so when you're trying to hire someone, they get an offer from two different companies. One company's offering them 10,000 shares. The other one is offering them 200,000 shares. Which one is the better offer? And most people are like, well, this one's 200,000, so that's the better one. And it turns out that one has 4 billion shares outstanding, so it's not really better. You know? So you know, that's why you end up, because it just takes the question off the table versus, and at least that's how I always thought about it. Uh, there was another question here. Yes. Yeah. So can I ask what the lawyer asked a question? So I kind of thought that the punchline was going to be, let's kill all the lawyers. But I don't think that's what you're saying. No, so can you, can you step back just a little bit? Other and people say, might say that. No. Yeah. And just you know, kind of what do you think the role ought to be, um, the relationship ought to be between the founders, the entrepreneurs, and legal counsel? And, yep. and try to overlay that sure. with all you said. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a simple. The question is, what should, how, how, how does someone, an entrepreneur, engage with an attorney? And it should be a strategic advisor. It should be a lot of these questions people are asking. It should be they should be asking of their attorney. What should be automated, though, is if I have to collect signatures from 20 angel investors, I shouldn't be paying someone $600 an hour to collect signatures and put them in a binder. right? That's, so that's, and basically, the platform is trying to get rid of all that overhead, right? so that the focus of the conversation can be about the strategic advice versus the execution of a bunch of mundane stuff. Like one of the attorneys that joined a shoebox said she was excited to, you know, to, to help attorneys to do more than be glorified assistants on a lot of this mundane stuff. Does that make some sense? 
You're, you're right yeah. that, that or, you know, well, lawyers I, end up chasing signatures. Yeah, or I'll give you an example. Or someone arguing over something just because they like it a particular way different than someone else. I know someone that just did a $2 million financing. There's $80,000 in fees, of which half of it was the two firms arguing over whose option plan was better. Now, both those option plans have been used successfully in many, many successful companies, right? The company didn't care about that, but they wasted four weeks, they wasted dollars and all this kind of stuff, right? And so it's also to try to help just take that away so people can focus on the strategic, what's important versus, you know, stylistic things, right? And I think it works in both directions. From the law firm's side, you're taking on a tremendous amount of risk every time you comb through a document, right? So you miss a key term, it costs a board member a million dollars and shares that were supposed to be allocated and weren't, there's potentially liability there. So it's a way to take the focus away from you know, errors and put it back on strategy. Because it's gotten, it gets, or I had one situation where we did a financing and the law firm allowed us to do something that killed the QSBS status. Right? QSBS, qualified small business stock, it's an esoteric tax thing, but it can be really important. It was really important a few years ago, right? And it's just because it had gotten so complex, they didn't even know that was happening by this thing that we were doing, right? And so, you know, or I've been in situations actually on the IP side where we didn't get a filing done in time because it wasn't automated to get everything in front of people at the right time. So we're trying to help that help that workflow so the quality of the work can be you know, even higher. Right? So we have five more minutes. Um, let's just Back there. all questions. I think. Yeah, I just have a quick question on like, uh, founders and co-founders. So I'm on the road kind of raising my first A round. Uh -huh. And um, I've raised like um, several hundred thousand of friends between So on a note family. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking to raise like um, a larger A round. Um, but the other problem I've encountered, and I'm encountering currently, is my CTO and my other technical people are not really co-founders. I've kind of paid for them this whole time. Mm -hmm. So um, my other question is, you know, you've been an angel investor. Is that a bad thing that I don't really have co-founders? That I'm kind of a solo entrepreneur. It depends on what you're trying to do. So the question is, so the question is, you know, is it a red flag if there's, if there's just one founder and there's no one else. If you're trying to do some breakthrough technology and you need certain other people to be, you know, kind of um, going above and beyond to make it happen, they better be incented to do that. I've already seen this play out where someone was trying to build a business. They tried to have a hired team. And as soon as they hit some bumps in the road, the team is gone, right? So that is a risk in that sense. But again, it depends on what you're trying to do. If what you're doing is not, doesn't require a particular rocket scientist that knows some special thing, right, and it's sort of just standard app development, sure, that, that's fine. But if you're trying to do something where you're building a technical asset that's highly differentiated, that would be a big red flag. Yeah. Most things, and it's always contextual. That's, that's the thing. Yes. Um, so most of the things we've talked about is, is about you know, um, the documentation and paperwork for uh, <coughs> getting investment. What about like when you want to work with something like for us in the case of food retail like Whole Foods mm -hmm. and everyone's like, oh, be careful, they're going to screw you over. What kind of things do we need to know? Yeah. Is that something you guys Yeah, this goes back to the question about that's, that's where you should be spending your time with your attorney figuring that stuff out, right? That's where it's incredibly contextual. The possibilities are infinite. Right, in terms of what's the right structure of a deal. But again, and, and while it's important that you document it right and you pick the right terms and whatnot, what determines what you can do is all about your leverage in that negotiation. Right? And that happens well before you're getting to that point. Right? But, but again, that's the vision here is that's when you want to be spending a lot of time with someone to give you the best advice. Right? So, so. Like well, and not only that, but it's, it's more... You, you have so much resource that you can apply to that legal budget. And that's what you want to be applying it to, not on the stuff that's just boilerplate that's done again and again. So, yes? Um, just curious about Shoebox. Uh, is it going to, for a startup, is going to replace most of the legal things? What it's going to do is, I mean, it. I mean, right now, if you go to Silicon Valley, a lot of the early stuff, or even here, people are waiving the fees because they want to get the clients, right? And 
What we're trying to do is just get people on a great, like there's still going to be an attorney involved in that time, right? But the hope is when you're spending money with the attorney, it's on the stuff that we were just talking about versus trying to wing that because you're afraid of big bills and all this kind of stuff, right? So that's how I, I imagine it will evolve, right? But we have to see, right? We're going to, this is a big experiment. Yes. So I just want to ask how large is usually the option pool is? So again, the size of the option pool, it's a budget that you have to do to build your business to get to your, whatever the milestone is for that round of financing, OK? And usually beyond, right? And so if you already have key members of the team, those don't have to be in the option pool budget. But the, the normal full budget would be about 20 points. That assumes you have to hire a full management team. Anyone else? Yes. Um, on your first new hires, you guys kind of talk through the list of things that you have. Is there any consideration around, and this is, it's, it's a preface, I come from Canada, so we sign like these employment insurance, uh -huh, uh -huh. and stuff like that. Is that, also, is that a thing in the States, or do you guys? I mean, it's different, yeah. right? I mean, when you hire someone, you're going to have, you know, benefits, right? There's going to be, I mean, well, Jason, you probably can cite this better than I can right now. What, what would you sign? What do you have to worry every about? Every state that you're in, you'll have to deal with unemployment insurance. You'll have to deal with every state that you hire someone. You'll have a whole new set of things to deal with. And your so payroll provider helps out a lot with this, typically, okay. too. OK. Yeah. Less covered under shoe box, more someone else's. Yeah, I mean, it's all, I mean, we'll see how all this evolves. But what we're trying to do is make it so that you don't have to become an expert in this stuff. Yeah. You can get to the point where you're large enough to hire a team, and they're the experts. Right, that's, that's, that's the thing. Once you get to 50 people, you've got someone on the in the company that knows this stuff. But the path of getting there can be very costly and waste the time of the folks that their comparative advantage is something else. So I think we're towards the end. So uh, just to sum it up, you know, legal process management, again, the idea is you don't have to know all this. You can delegate it. But there's, you do have to know the salient terms. And you have to treat this as a process. And the reason is, it's super complex very quickly. And three themes, time and money, right? Spend your time on the right things. Risk, you can be dropping some time bombs into these documents, so watch the risk. And rails, finally. Remember, most of this is boilerplate. Keep it as boilerplate. Don't get creative. The only time you should deviate is if you're actually adding value. So um, this was a big experiment trying this. How many people would sit through more of this and found it interesting by a show of hands? It might be like, hey, you know, this wasn't what I was expecting. So I'm kind of getting a few people, kind of half the room. OK. The, um, and um, hopefully we can do more things like this in the future that are a bit more specific. This was a big open-ended survey of things to think about. So, OK. Fair enough.